Hey, Justin, how you doing, my friend? Hey, Al, I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for joining me today on what is episode one of what we're calling Fafal Live. So thanks for taking the leap and uh, joining me with this. <laughs> oh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's, uh, it's, it's really nice to be here. Well, hey, uh, you know, there's been a lot going on. Uh, you have been in the center of what uh, your response there at Glint has been with your clients. And, and obviously, you've done some fantastic research on how people are thinking and feeling right now. So if you would introduce yourself and share what's been going on with you and Glint. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Al. So hi, everyone. Uh, Justin Black. Um, I didn't realize, Al, that I was going to have to see a video of myself before. <laughs> uh, I came on, so uh, I'm probably still blushing. Uh, I lead the people science team at Glint, which you just got a little bit of an introduction to. We're responsible for the sciences, the methodologies, the approaches that go into the Glint platform, which is designed to help people be happier and more successful at work. And then we also provide the consulting services and the research uh, on the site uh, to, to help our customers, but also to come back and inform the new products uh, we create. And so like Al said, you know, when something like COVID happens or something like Black Lives Matter happens and there aren't existing, you know, how to's for uh, for how to respond, what to ask, what data to collect, what to do with it. Our team uh, gets together uh, a bunch of experts, creates those and gets them out. So uh, kudos to all those folks you just saw in that video who've been working really hard over the past few months, as you can imagine. Well, I mean, you mentioned some of the topics uh, on minds of everybody right now, uh, particularly here in, in the U.S. Uh, the past couple weeks have been, in my view, extraordinary, as I just mentioned. Uh, yeah. And obviously we're doing, yeah, we're dealing with the COVID-19 and, you know, how we're thinking about return to workplace or, you know, whatever organizations are, are calling it. So, you know, where's your energy right now? I mean, where do you see uh, you all serving your uh, clients and what do you think is not yet you know a priority that that should be i have some ideas that you know, we've talked about in the past but i just want to see where you are right now yeah well so it's an, it's an interesting time for us just to personally from a mission and vision standpoint so our vision is a world where everyone loves their jobs and mm -hmm. you know when everything else is going great this concept of loving your job seems like a good thing to focus on and we've had to do a lot of thinking about, you know, what does that mean in the context of, um, do I f even feel like I belong at work? Do I even feel like I'm heard uh, and involved? Mm -hmm. And and so we still think that everybody, right? So everybody should have the opportunity to love their jobs. I think what we've had is a wake-up call that we're, we're much further away from that than I think anybody was really uh, talking uh, much about. Uh, and so um, so that's one big thing that that we're thinking about. Um, the other, you know, our focus is really driven by the questions our customers are asking us, the things they're asking us for help on. And there are really mm -hmm. two things. One is, you know, how do we support our employees, right? The first thing everybody's thinking is, how are my people doing and what do they need? Uh, because these are, you know, like, these are, there's no playbook for this, right? This hasn't happened in this way before. Uh, and so actually, it's interesting. If you look at the most common survey question people are asking is, how are you doing? It's some form of, how are you doing? The second piece right. is reimagining workplaces, and we could probably talk more about this, but that sort of the, the most recent, most popular items on surveys are related to workplaces. Do you want to come back? Do you want to come back all the time or just some of the time? What are you worried about? What do you miss? Uh, and then teams are using those data to kind of reimagine their spaces short term for people who must work and then kind of mid and long term. For example, um, what does virtual collaboration look like when there's no longer an equal playing field? Right, right now we're all online. But what happens when 20% of people are back in the office? Uh, so uh, those are the two topics I think that are probably most uh, most top of mind for folks right now. You know, it's, it's really a uh, uh, paradigm shift is you know, maybe too cliche. Uh, however, you have been in the center of the emergence of employee engagement over the last 20 years. And that has been itself an emergence from employee satisfaction. And it was you know, kind of the thing that organizations held their hat on to understand culture 
And again, I'm skipping some steps and we can talk about the right or wrong of that. But now there's this notion of well-being, you know, just the very basic, are you okay? And so where do you see that going or do you see it, you know, staying? Is is well-being kind of the right overarching question uh, to be asking or is engagement as we formerly knew it, you know, kind of a a luxury and it's going to, you know, it's going to be less important moving forward. I mean, what are your thoughts there? I, you know, I think the great thing for people like me um, who so I see so many different models and we test so many different models and, you know, everybody on this uh, call knows that um, there are reasonable arguments for many of those models to be true. Right. And one of the things I really like about situations like this is it reminds us that there isn't one outcome that matters all the time, right? There are mm-hmm. multiple outcomes that we track for different purposes. Right now, well-being is really important. The correlation to traditional employee engagement measures is generally 0.6 or above, but it's not as correlated with engagement as things like belonging, right? And so it is a different outcome. And we even see, for example, if you ask, does the company take care of me as an individual? Uh, you get stronger correlations with engagement. But if you just ask, how are you doing? And you, on a scale from not very well to very well, you get lower correlations with engagement. So there is this, you know, we're talking about something that is less under the control in many ways of the organization. It doesn't mean it's less important. Uh, so I don't think it should replace or challenge the, the importance of engagement. We just have to think about how to layer these things throughout the year so that we're getting insights on all of these key outcomes at reasonable points. Now, you know, there's a, a few things that come to mind as, as you say that, but I want to go to to this notion that you know, when you talk about employees and the fact that they might have some preference for returning to workplace and uh, they might have a preference staying home or some hybrid model, uh, there's this implication that you know, the work is staying the same, that the health of the organization is the same. And so people have, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, depending on the industry and the company, yeah. have anxiety about whether or not their job is going to be around and whether or not um, you know, they're going to be able to have the same level of productivity and commitment uh, to their job that they did uh, before. So can you, yeah. you know, speak to that overarching you know, anxiety? And you know, do you think or- organizations are really dealing with that uh, effectively enough from in a broad way? Yeah, so I have, so the data I'll apply to this, Al, are um, responses from a few hundred companies, uh, sort of three million plus responses uh, over the past three months, and then kind of deep dive, you know, observations into a hundred plus um, interventions. Because if we look across all of that, uh, we actually see some things that surprised us in a good way. So, you know, Many, many, many employees, many more than we thought, upwards of 90% and some cuts uh, feel like their company is doing a great job responding or good or great job responding. And so that's good, right? So they're rallying around these bad times that we're seeing happen. And, you know, there's a bias, obviously, in our sample, you know, the companies who use GLET tend to be people-driven organizations, but we even see some of those shifts in our panel data that we collect to track trends across the globe. And so, so that's good news. I think the bad news is, and it's really clear, and it speaks directly to your point, is that it's really clear that a large percentage, much larger than normal of people, are burnt out or about to be burnt out, right? So if you think about Mm -hmm. the clinical definition of burnout of, you know, stress over a long period of time that makes you unproductive, right, and unhealthy, it's not just high stress, Uh, we can see indications of that both in the scores in the data, but also where the NLP engine is looking for mentions of phrases like, I'm so exhausted, I don't feel like I can do X, right? And flagging Mm -hmm. rates. And so those rates have gone up from 2.7%, which is sort of a normal rate, to 5.4%. And so if you think about the fact that the machine can pick up 150 topics, the fact that the rate is 5.4% is uh, is indicative of the fact that we should accept that people are stressed out that people are having trouble disconnecting just like the rest of us are. And we, we need to work around it. You know, it's just, just the reality of it right now is we need to accept that people need to disconnect and need more time off, need more flexibility yeah. in, in, in where they do their work and when they, and when they get it done. Yeah, it, there's been uh, some research done by um, 
uh, Carly Scott Murphy and uh, Microsoft, and you know, I know you're part of the Microsoft uh, your community, uh, where th the number of meetings is going up. Um, per day, but the duration of those meetings is going down. Uh, obviously, people who are working from home, which is most you know, certainly knowledge workers, they you know have different stresses based on the stage of life of their family. Um, or conversely, they might have they might be lonely <laughs> and they might be longing yeah. for a connection. But the, all these uniquenesses are often, correct me if I'm wrong, lost uh, because we're not we don't have that data. We're not collecting you know, that data. So my pointed question, you know, back to you, is to what extent do people, analytics professionals, or you know, us as a uh, as a group of uh, professionals who can help, you know, to what extent do we need to be more creative in going after this data, these insights that you know, formerly maybe we were we weren't able to get or that um, we had some reluctance to to go after because with these insights then we can take appropriate action if not you know we we might be guessing what are your thoughts there yeah so to me this is a more exciting problem to solve than the one that we have traditionally been asked to solve which is to correlate investments in people to uh to business outcomes the idea that the outcome we're trying to drive is a more frequent, higher quality conversation. So if you think about the scenario we're talking about, you know, what does an individual on my team need to help her be happier and more successful to, to bring her best self to work and do her best work? It's going to be very different person to person right now, right? So am I, as a, as a people scientist or people analyst, able to deliver a manager a perfect data-driven recommendation about what to do with each person? No, like that seems absurd right now based on you know, what we know about the science. Uh, but could I use data about the types of habits that managers who do connect with their people in that individualized way do to nudge that manager to, to do those things like check in weekly, seek feedback, set goals that are agile and and tell people that you've shifted them when things have changed, right? And celebrate progress, not achievement. Those are four key habits we see uh, in the data be uh, lead to good outcomes, right? If we can use the data to drive that conversation, drive focus in the organization of creating those habits, I think it brings a new relevance to people analytics uh, that goes beyond the linking to, uh, to business outcomes. Yeah, I, gosh, I, I love that response because it is the case where, if we can have better conversations and understand what's really going on with individuals, and that might not be data per se on them, it might be uh, kind of a, a, a higher level analysis, but they might be in a classification, a job family, whatever the case may be, that has uh, that might be stressed out. So the the pointed question is, is this: is productivity has always been important, and many organizations have tried rightly so to optimize their people investment. Uh, arguably what that has done is create organizations that are inelastic, that can snap, meaning work just doesn't get done because there's no more capacity, that they're just 100% maxed out. And now we have the situation where in many cases they have to work more. They don't have the same level of focus that they maybe would have in the office. Um, so how do we have a responsibility at the end of the day, not only as people analytics leaders, but as organizational leaders inside of outside of HR to be more aware of those goals, uh, the, more aware of the amount of work we're putting on people? Because for me, it's been a blind spot. We haven't really, we just, OK, there's a bunch of work. We'll throw it at them and they'll figure it out. And now we're in this case, yeah. well, that's not really working so well because, you know, and people are getting burned out. So, you know, any thoughts there about being yeah. smarter about how we measure and manage work? Yeah, I, I have two. One is a, is is smaller. So let me start with there. And the other one's a little bit bigger. I think when you say what responsibility do we have right now, the thing that keeps coming to my mind is the responsibility to empower individuals to own their own growth and success. And I don't mean to take the responsibility off the manager. We've been talking about this for a long time, but you know, the reality is the system isn't working for a lot of people right now. And mm -hmm. 
that's clearer today than it ever has been. But the other reality is, you know, if we give people some simple structure about understanding where they are in their path to happiness and success and use relevant data to do it, you know, if we have where we have relevant data, and if not, really good reflection questions, right? Um, mm -hmm. People can own their own journey. And I think that's really important. I think if we think about the individual as the user, as opposed to the executive, uh, as we design our people analytics projects, and I know we, a lot of us do that, right? Um, I, I think we'll be able to help people grow and find intrinsic motivation in a work environment that is otherwise uh, stressful and has lots of uncertainty about the future. So that's my soapbox on growth and what people analytics can do there. <laughs> I think it sits within a bigger context, which is what I would call people success, right? And so, you know, I, I used the phrase before, bring your best work, uh, sort of bring your best to do your best work, right? Bring your best self to do your best work. And I, that's the easiest way to think about people success. And I think to your point, it requires taking these traditional silos we've had. You know, we've got an employee engagement program here, a performance management program here, an L&D program over here. And assuming that when I do my thing in my silo, the other team in their silo is gonna pick it up and do their thing and it's all gonna work together beautifully. And the you know user at the end of the day is gonna have a good experience. And what we hear from managers is it's not quite that, right? Uh, right. And if we can bring those things together into a single experience, just forget that we're in separate functions and just think about this from the point of view of the employee. So let's take a traditional employee survey. Uh, it's a very easy example, right? So uh, we get our results and we call this an engagement program, but really it's much, much bigger, right? When you boil it down, your results are just insights. You take those insights into a conversation that you're having with your team about how you can improve. You acknowledge where you're doing well and not doing well, right? You work on a focus area together and you make a commitment. That commitment turns into a goal. You've set that goal. So now we've done engagement and we've done a little performance management. And then in order to achieve that goal, you go seek information, support learning. So now we've got learning in there too, right? So it's one process. We've mm -hmm. called it part of an engagement program, but really it spans across everything. And so I think, you know, my push has been on a tactical side. Let's think in terms of graph databases, right? Person at the center. And on a strategy side, let's think in terms of people success. How do we get more people having more frequent conversations? How do we make it easier to go from insight to conversation to goal to continuous improvement and loop back around mm -hmm. and forget about whether it's engagement's responsibility or performance management's responsibility or L&D's responsibility? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I wanna to talk to you a, a bit about governance, which would be bringing together these formerly disparate uh, you know, functions because what you just shared, put, in my view, the worker experience front and center and say, hey, it's not about these different functions, it's about you know, how I'm having these conversations, how I'm actually having the space to say no, that, that that's too much. And that's, you know, I might not have the resources, the, the time uh, window isn't big enough to actually complete the work. Because historically, again, I, I often say that I personally grew up in the suck it up generation. So this is the way it is, you know, just, uh, you know, get it done. And now, yeah. particularly in this moment, uh, younger people have more fortitude, uh, in my view, to, to say no, which is good, push back. Um, but I just think that's becoming a norm in more evolved organizations. Uh, but this is where I, the, the question I really want to ask is, as a leader, one of my biggest development areas personally has been slowing down to create the space to have the conversation that you just described. Uh, so many people have been you know, leaders, managers, whomever, have just been running so fast that they, they haven't slowed down to really hold people in uh, a safe place to have a very authentic conversation about your work, the resources, the realistic nature of the goals and all that. So can you speak to how you advocate for you know, creating this this space? Or is it just something that you know, just uh, assume that's done? Yeah, so there are two phases. I think in the current phase, so we saw this really interesting thing. So the organizations uh, that we would classify as having uh, regular engagement in those four habits I mentioned, regular conversations, two-way feedback, uh, agile goals, and continuous improvement mindset over, you know, achieve the score and celebrate. Um, we look at those organizations, they fared better through uh, March and April than other organizations. Um, and so I think 
you know, evidence clearly points to uh, to start to start to build these habits. I think you know, big question um, that our customers ask us is how and, and where to start. I think that's where you're going. So phase one is there's no technology yet that's going to make this automatic for you. However, um, it's getting much easier. There's already a lot more integration in systems like uh, Microsoft's and our own uh, to kind of give you insights, right? To use the data you all are collecting as people analysts and I'm collecting as people analysts and nudge people along the way. So schedule appointments instead of asking them to schedule appointments, right? Um, in phase one though, I don't think the technology is there to make that automatic for everybody. And so we're still gonna have to rely on things like getting our executive teams to engage in these behaviors. And that's what we've seen in these organizations that have done it already. They've done it the hard way. They've done it the old way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, top, top down modeling made by uh, uh, complemented by really high ease of use at the, at the bottom uh, that ties directly to the problem. I think moving forward, we're gonna see a lot more bottom up empowerment through simple things like automated scheduling of things that need to get done, like your one-on-one -on -one with your direct reports yeah. out that you probably forget to schedule. And then automatic yeah. scheduling for example, time, you know, five hours before for you to prep for that conversation. So um, that's where it's going, it's more integration. Yeah, I, I love that you're talking about habit formation because I believe it's a super healthy mindset, both for individuals and organizations to have. And I know we have probably seven, eight minutes left. And I want to ask this pointedly because many organizations have created task force that have been multidisciplinary. They've included facilities, HR, legal, operations, uh, finance, you know, and now we have this kind of de facto governance model where the human insights are coming to the fore and people analytics professionals have been in some organizations front and center in prioritizing and elevating the narrative and in turn recommendations of what an appropriate response might be. So are you seeing that same thing emerge and of those organizations that do have the employee insights, the people insights uh, front and center, do you see them being more resilient and would you expect them to keep these governance bodies going um, on into the future? It's, it's such a good question, Al, that I'm not exactly, actually, it's such a good question that I'm going to answer it like I like a professor. I'm going to say it depends. Um, <laughs> or a consultant. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, as I look across the, the, the companies, I'm thinking of to do this well. Uh, it's actually, there's not a lot of consistency in terms of which function has owned this. It's the person who's had the courage to say, I think this thing, call it people success or whatever they call it, what we call people success is important. We're gonna bring this together. I'm gonna own this and it's an ecosystem. It all comes back down to serving you know, the individual employee. Sometimes it's through the engagement program itself. Sometimes it's through the people analyst team. Sometimes it's through L&D. Sometimes it's through performance uh, and talent. Uh, and so I think right now, because it's not a declared job title, uh, people are declaring it their job title. And uh, and so it's emerging that way. To me, you know, I've been thinking about this concept for a few years and testing it out. And so to me, you know, I, I have that bias to me. It just seems obvious we should create this, this team, this function, this role, and have somebody focus on the organization on bringing these things together. Because otherwise, we're asking people who have disparate goals to uh, to share responsibility and it's just, you know, it's just rot. That's just rot with uh, potential error. Yeah, no, it, it, you know, it's my hope. And yeah, I'm, it's something I'm advocating for. I just uh, am looking for more, you know, use cases. And the thing is, and, and this is what I advocate, and I'd be interested uh, in your perspective as we start to wrap up, is that the appropriate future in many cases has not been created yet. So, so many people are looking for use cases, use cases, but what is appropriate to move forward in your particular organization, arguably, it needs to be new. And that takes someone to your point to say, okay, it's about people success. These are the underlying processes and technologies and data that we need to, to generate. And a perfect example is what you all have done there at Glint. You, you've brought together your performance and engagement and learning you know, into your, your tool set, but that would then facilitate such integrated 
you know, conversation. So that's uh, shamelessly a softball to you, <laughs> but you know, at the same time, yeah. um, you know, what do you think? What do you think about this notion of you, you have to create what's most appropriate moving forward? Yeah, so that's exactly. So from a mission perspective, we do that because our goal is to increase our impact on the world, right? And so the more people we can get using more aspects of the platform. Uh, we see that they're happier and more successful. And so we want to do that. From a commercial perspective, obviously, that means more revenue for our business, right? And so there are two really good reasons, uh, two, two really good reasons to push that. And so increasingly what we see is that the, the person buying a, a product in our industry is wanting a lot of engagement features, maybe, for example, but also wanting to be able to um, to guide the conversation that happens after that, more so than a traditional engagement program would, more like a guided conversation or performance development uh, piece of mm-hmm. software, which is why we add those features in, right? And then HR resources are strapped. So our customers are saying, uh, we really don't have time to coach as much as we did before, even though we want to. So that's why we prioritize the LinkedIn learning integration and brought those courses directly in. So when I'm a manager, I get a score, I can set a goal, System knows that goal and says you should probably watch these few things to help you hit that goal, right? And it really removes a lot of the burden on HR right now. And so that's why we prioritize those things. Over time, we may see a shift, right? We may see the engagement survey itself be less important and the conversation be more important. And surveys are layered in as insights along the way, as opposed to being kind of regularly scheduled uh, throughout. But I think having a a full platform allows you to kind of flex. And that's why we built it that way. Uh, you know, things change throughout the year, as we've noticed uh, over the past few months. Yeah, yeah yes, uh, yes, they do. So, you know, I know you do, did some research uh, recently. And so how can the people, listeners find that research and how can they learn more about what you and your team are doing? Yeah, we have put out an unprecedented amount of the material we only we generally only give to customers. And so um, go to the website. It's glintinc.com. There's a resources page there, banner right at the top uh, for free surveys you can uh, put out, free survey questions, conversation guides. Those are the most valuable in my mind toolkits for things like uh, what do we do when people are working remotely? How do we have conversations with them about development? Uh, so go use those resources. The team worked really hard on them. And uh, you can follow hashtag people success on LinkedIn uh, for uh, for all of our publishing. Well, hey, uh, yeah, Justin, thank you for doing what you do and, and how you do it. Uh, obviously, we've known each other for a number of years, and thank you for your personal support of me and what we've been doing. And uh, you know, kudos to what you and the Glint team have been doing, not only for your customers, to your point, but to the broader uh, community. So just know it's appreciated, and uh, you know, look forward to continuing uh, working with you and learning from you, and uh, you know, making some great things happen. So you know, thank you. Thanks. Same to you, Al.